action. Hey, this is the hardcore legend Mick Foley, and thank you for watching Geek Culture. Damn! Oh, God, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to be your interviewer tonight, and my guest is a man who doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to give him a small one. He's a multi-time New York Times bestseller and a WWE Hall of Famer. You know him as Mankind, Dude Love, and Patrick Jack, Mick Foley. <laughs> Absolutely. That will show up on the internet. Yeah. All right. Geek so culture. If you guys get a boring Q and A. Blame this guy right here. Because <laughs> there's a direct correlation between how honest I can be and how many of those things I see. <laughs> he's not with me. Okay. He's, he's kind of with me, but he's still doing it. Keep it there. All right. A lot of pressure. That's a very flattering shot. Either. <laughs> <laughs> Fanny pack looks fantastic. Ah. Uh, <laughs> started as Mankind, he was, he was in brown, his clothes yeah. were kind of drab, yeah. the music, you had uh, violins, it was a very kind of a quiet, yeah. uh, it wasn't very explosive, like you said, right. guys like Shawn Michaels and Undertaker and stuff. Yeah. Why was that? Well, in the beginning, well, they had this, this thing at the time, can't wear black, only the Undertaker wears black. And I guess that was true on the day Mr. McMahon spoke those words. Right. But within weeks, there were like four other guys coming into the company dressed in black. And so I got that like solid, like UPS delivery truck brown, you know, head to toe in brown. And they wanted some eerie music, you know. And, and uh, so Ode to Freud was a little take on, um, on uh, it was like kind of like, it was Chopin's Death March with a little bit of extra pep in it, and it was fine when I was a bad guy, but when you make that inevitable switch, especially if you're good enough at being bad, 
fans will get behind you as a good guy or a baby face. And that's what happened at WWE, didn't have any new music in the pipeline. So the fans were with me, but I mean, and I'm not taking the reaction that the top superstars get away from them. There's definitely a Pavlovian response. You know, you hear those opening chords to any of the great entrance music and people want to get excited. And it was just hard to get people excited when my music was going. And so it just happened that a um, uh, little known event in WWE history, I, I defeated a very unheralded and today uh, seldom heard from wrestler named Dwayne The Rock Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I came out for my interview the next, uh, the next week on Monday Night Raw and Jim Johnson had written that great peppy uh, rap music and it has been with us ever since. That's great. Uh, so if you could go back, just looking back on your entire career of wrestling, if you could pick one match from when you started till you're retired, what would be your favorite match? Oh man, of all the matches I ever had? Yes sir. Um, I would have to go with uh, Randy Orton and yeah. me. You think that's a good choice? Backlash, May 2004. And what's really cool about it is even given all the great matches Randy has had, as far as I know, that's still his favorite as well. So it was really good. Uh, I watched it with a family. They had me over. They spent a, a nice sum of money to have me over the house, and we uh, we uh, donated the money to a fund for Ashley Massaro's uh, daughter's college education. And they wanted to watch my matches. They wanted to see my favorite. So I played them that one, and I think it still holds up pretty good. Pretty. Pretty. What do you guys think? It was a fantastic match, right? By the way. Anyone realize the, uh, the Larry David reference there? <laughs> I did that in India with Kurt Angle sitting next to me, and not one person got the reference. And I went, worked out pretty good, pretty, pretty. And Kurt goes to me, no one knows what you're talking about. <laughs> pretty, pretty. He goes, knock it off. But I said, pretty. <laughs> Embarrassing me. Pretty. Pretty. <laughs> well, sticking with favorites, uh, who were some of your favorite wrestlers that you ever encountered or used to watch as a child or just in general? Who were some oh, yeah. of your favorite that you've ever Well, seen? Uh, growing up, I was, uh, you know, I, we only got WWF at that time, right? And so it was like Bruno and Ivan Putski and Chief J. Strongbow and Ivan Koloff and and then when I got really into wrestling, it was, it was Jimmy Superfly Stucka. But once I got involved in the actual business of wrestling, there was a good friend of mine named uh, Brian Hildebrand, who later went on to referee as Dr. Mark Curtis. And he told me, like, I was having some trouble, like, you know, like brawling and throwing punches. And he gave me this VHS cassette uh, from Japan. And he, he wanted me to watch the Funks versus Hanson and Brody. He said it was some of the best brawling you'll ever see. And that tape turned everything away around for me. Because when I got to see the Funks and Brody and Hanson, like I had an idea of what I wanted to do. And Dynamite Kid against Tiger Mask was uh, on that same VHS. And so I was like, man, I know I can't brawl like those guys. You know, I know I can't fly and do the technical stuff like Dynamite Kid, but what if? What if I combine those two styles? And so I can consider myself like a hybrid of uh, Dynamite Kid, Brody, Funks, Stan Hansen. And I'd say, uh, looking back, it worked out pretty good. Pretty, pretty. Yeah, but those, yeah, that was a really, I don't know where I'd be um, without that VHS tape, but I think it's safe to say I wouldn't be on this stage here. Right here in this part of Florida. <laughs> Alright, so I want to move on to uh, WrestleMania. It's generally the biggest show of the year. It's kind of everybody's favorite. You'll get fans from all over the world yeah, for it. Literally all over the world. All over the world. Uh, what would be some of your favorite WrestleMania moments? My own personal ones? Yeah, or, or any of you have seen? I mean, if you didn't you, you, you make it fun of me? Because I only had one WrestleMania moment? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, when it came down to 2006, um, I asked Edge to ride me on the fact that despite the legendary status 
I enjoy that I've never actually had that classic WrestleMania moment. And so he put a lot of pressure on me, and therefore I put a lot of pressure on myself. But if you go back and look at that match, it's another one that really stands up. And the moment that he speared me through that table that was on fire, uh, even though I was surrounded by this weird potpourri of burnt hair, charred flesh, and blood, when Referee Earl Hebner made that three count, man, I felt like a giant weight was lifted off my shoulder because I realized I just had that magic WrestleMania moment. And can I tell you what happened then? Like, I did not have a cell phone at the time. So in 2006, I'd have to go into the crowd, you know, and use the pay phone. Like, put a hood over my head. And I called up knowing how concerned my wife would be about me. And I said, back lines make And she said, is Edge okay? <laughs> what about me? What about me? And then I watched it back the next day, and I can understand why. It was like shaking, you know, you tremors. Like, but it was great. It was a great match, and uh, definitely my, my favorite WrestleMania moment. Fantastic. Um, so I know last year you did the Hell in a Cell tour. I did, yeah. You did, and it, it, it went very well. I, I, yeah, it was fantastic. Anyone show of hands if you saw the 20 Years of Hell show on the network? That's five of you. Okay. <laughs> it's on there. It's really it's very good. I'm really proud of it. So speaking of tours, um, are you doing any tours this year? Can people expect to see you in different locations? Um, and you can always sit while I'm here. Right here. Yeah. In Ocala, Florida. Um, I don't know. You know, I just, I, uh, I was so happy. I mean, we set the bar pretty high, pretty high with that last show. And uh, now I've got like one show, one event coming up in uh, Toronto before SummerSlam. One that's part of Starcast. So I'm like writing down a few stories here and there. But I'm gonna wait. I don't want to sound like all artsy and self-important, but I'm gonna wait until like those stories feel like they're calling out to me to be written down, and then I'll start writing. But what happened last year? I was uh, I knew I had the show coming up, and I swear to you, a week before the show, for those of you don't know, it's an entire one-hour show based around that one pivotal match from June of uh, 1998, the Cell match with the Undertaker. I didn't have one word written on Yes! And uh, but then once I started writing, like I couldn't stop. Like the ideas were just kind of pouring out of me. And I went from thinking, how in the world am I going to do a one hour show based around one match to thinking, how am I going to cut out enough stuff so it's only one hour because there were so many things to talk about. So I'll, I'll do some thinking and uh, you know, I, if I have ideas, I'll write them down in a notebook and maybe get back out on the road with a tour in 2021. Sounds great. Uh, real quick, just asking about uh, the Hell in a Cell match. Afterwards, I, I don't necessarily want to ask how you feel, because I can only imagine, but did you know that you made an impact that 20 plus years later, people are going to remember you as the guy that Undertaker threw off? No, himself? absolutely not. I did not feel like you had made any impact. Um, so much so that uh, if you go back and watch the Raw that followed that pay-per-view, it wasn't in what we call the cult open. So there were no videos of that in the first few minutes. There was no reference to the match throughout a, a good a one hour of the show. Shawn Michaels had come back as like a returning guest. He mentioned the match and came back to me and said, well, those guys weren't gonna talk about it. He pointed to the monitor at the announcers and I figured I would. So I am really fortunate that there was not social media at the time. I think if there had been social media, it would have trended for like two days and then been forgotten. And instead, it picked up this organic momentum, you know, like a snowball going downhill and just kept building. And so I remember wrestling and being in main events in the week that followed. And there was no, I didn't gather any feeling that the audience felt like they had seen something special. But as the weeks went by, and then the months, and even the years, this match just started building in stature to the point where I get asked about it far more now than I did right after the fact. Right. Uh, and, then, and then one last thing about your matches. I, how did it feel the night that you won the world title? Because there, there was a thing on WCW where they announced that you were going to be winning the WWE title later that night. And then you did, and it, it was such a huge ratings grab that it really started to shift the tone for the Monday Night Wars. So, I mean, how did you feel 
Watching it doesn't matter how you felt. <laughs> I can do that too. <laughs> it's more fun if I do it to a child. <laughs> no, it's yeah, not. Yeah. It's... So, maybe him. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Yeah. Come on up here. Yeah, come on. Yeah, just stand right there. Yeah, this young lady right here. Yeah. 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 Okay, what's your name? It doesn't matter what your name is. <laughs> <laughs> then I give her money for making her feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Easiest money of all the way. You know, it did, it, it did feel amazing. Uh, we did. I mean, like, I see Dave Pender in the wings. He was there at WCW when it happened. And, uh, man, it was. We called it a war for a reason. You know, they weren't taking any prisoners. And uh, at first time, my feelings were genuinely hurt. Like, it really hurt me deep down. Until the next day, when the ratings came out. And the ratings showed that immediately following WCW, for those who don't know, our show had been taped. Every other week we'd be live, and then they would. The next day we would tape uh, Raw, and that show would be on a delay. They air on a tape delay. Six days later, WCW was live every single week, and they had taken to giving away the results of our matches in an attempt to get people to switch the channel or not to go to their show. And for the most part, it worked. But on that fateful night, evidence showed that as soon as Tony Schiavone told people that Mick Foley was winning their titles and there was no reason to change the channels. Half a million people paid no heed to Tony Schiavone and immediately changed the channels to WWE. And so uh, it went from being a bad moment for me that hurt my feelings to being absolutely the best thing that could have happened to me. To not only change the, the, the way that I was viewed by fans to some extent, but in a major way, it changed the way that I was viewed behind the scenes by the powers that be. And it was like almost overnight I went from being like a respected, grizzled journeyman to a superstar. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Eric Bischoff. <laughs> well, superstar, it's been fantastic having you here. Yeah, you guys ready for a great night of action? <laughs> you guys, are you ready?